Come on, guys. This is this this class, by the way. I'm not going to lecture to you guys. This is going to be interactive. You're going to be working while you're here. So that's I mentioned for whoever was here last week. I did mention that. So if you're used to workshops and you're used to hands-on trainings and that sort of thing, that's kind of how I conduct my workshops. Why? Because. I'm a product of the uh, city school system here, and I've gone to uh, NYU, things like that. And um, and the least thing that I want to be is sitting in a class where there's some boring lecturer just talking down to me. Like he knows or she knows everything, and we don't know anything. So that's not what this is about, okay? Um, there's a reason why I call myself an empowerment coach and not a life coach. So you guys, come on up. Tony, come on up. Fill it in. Fill it in. That's going to be your first exercise. <laughs> yes. And here, Stella and I here met at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We're both producers at the firehouse that's nearby on 104th and Lexington. Does anybody know about that? Yes. How many people? Show of hands. Wow, so the rest of you, if you don't know about that, is Manhattan Neighborhood Network on 104th and between Lexington and 3rd, and it's free TV. You can become a TV producer, produce your own program, public access, okay? It's a state-of-the-art digital production studio. You need to take advantage, it's totally free. Estella's passing out the stuff that we're gonna use for, for today's class, but in a little while also, we're gonna give you some information on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Take advantage of it. It's free. State of the art computers. Uh, you learn how to edit video. I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, which was my class project at the end of the class. I'm going to show you my little class project that I did there in Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And Estella is a student there as well. And she did. Um, she also did. Everyone had a different topic that they were kind of covering in their in the, uh, as part of their class project. So Estella did one. Um, it was on domestic violence, right? Uh, homeless mothers and children in New York City. Okay. That was it. And I did mine actually on Latino Leadership Institute. And the reason why is because Jaime Estadas, which you guys know, about three years ago just fired me up. I had never had a political bone or interest in my body for most of my life. I had like a, like a bullshit, bullshit detector for, for politicians, right? And uh, I went to 32BJ for the first reincarnation of the Latino Leadership Institute, which was, uh, I think we originally launched it 1999, so this was about 10 years in, in late dormant, and I came across Highland in 2010, and I went to 32BJ for that first uh, reincarnation of, of the class. A lot of, I see some faces here that were there that day, and what happened was that it fired up something in me which was to take an interest and, and a hands-on interest in the political process, especially here in our community and in the city. Because historically, as we know, how many Latinos are in power here? And the ones that were in power, where are they now? Same, same, you know, like that. You know, we laugh about it, but it's, it's, really, it's really sad. It's not like we're the only ones who commit crimes, but we, we almost have like like a, like a higher standard that we need to pay attention to and, and do away with the, with the old status quo of how people do things in the city. And that's what I propose to help you guys with, with empowerment coaching. How many people here, by a show of hands, know what coaching is? Probably at a different level than yours, but I, yeah, I do. Okay, so not even a third of the room, and that's pretty good, that's pretty interesting because you guys are my target audience. I didn't know what coaching was either until I went to coaching school. And I thought that by having friends always come to me as a kid, 12, 13 years old, people will come up to me and ask me all kinds of questions. Hey Juan, what should I do about this? Hey Juan, what do you think of that? And of course, we all have opinions, right? So I would say the first thing that came to mind, which was usually right, but that wasn't really the point. I would say whatever came to mind, and they would go off and play, I was 12, 13 years old, and a month or two later, these kids would come back and ask me the same question. And that started developing one of the basic coaching tools, which is to listen more than you talk. I'm talking here today because I'm doing a presentation, but normally, if I were coaching you, I'm going to listen more than I talk. And so what happened? These kids would come and ask me the same questions, and I would say, yo, didn't, didn't I tell you what to do already? And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, did you do it? No, boom, 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 they go the fist. Because that's how inner city 13-year-olds communicate, right? So, 
20 something years later, I go to coaching school and I have one of these aha moments. The first day in class, which was none of these kids were asking me to tell them what to do. How many of us here have people that call them up, family, friends, lovers, whatever, and are always asking you for your opinion or, to, or, or a question about something? How many of you? Most of us. That's right. But guess what? I realized in coaching school that those kids weren't asking me to tell them what to do. They were asking me to help them figure it out for themselves. That's a completely different question and a far more powerful ability to help a person when you can help them arrive at that answer for themselves, not by telling them. Okay, when you're a kid, okay, you ask your, your parents, mommy this, daddy that, and you expect a straightforward answer. Nobody goes into these question and answer sessions to kind of help you arrive at that answer because you're still too young. However, we're going to get into that later on in the presentation of, of when it is that people start the actual programming of us. We're like computers. Computers actually are like us. Because computers were modeled after human beings. But you're going to see how it is that the programming that gets done to people is very similar to the programming that you do on a computer. We got a hard drive, we got, the, we got a, a short term memory, we got a long term memory, and guess what? Just like on a computer, unless you erase what's on there, you can't turn on a PC and expect to find Mac programs on it. Because it's a PC, and vice versa. And for you techies out there that I know that you can do both on one system, I'm not talking about that. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's get started. My name is Juan Esteban, and I'm not going to bore you guys with telling you what I've done and who I am in the onset, because this isn't about impressing you. I'm not here to impress you. It's me that I'm impressed with you guys that you're here. That's impressive to me, because that means that you want to learn what it is that I can teach you and show you and, uh, and benefit from it. So I want everyone to leave here today with an aha moment. You can, each and every one of you here, if you're open to it, is going to leave here with a, little, with a little spark that's just going to expand as you think about it. And it's going to lead you to progress. It's going to help you address and look at and stare in the face some of the things and some of the shit that you've been dealing with most of your lives. And when Jaime gave me the opportunity to come and, and speak to, to, uh, to the Latino Leadership Institute, it was an honor to me because I feel that our community could de definitely benefit from coaching. No one tells us about coaching in school, certainly not public school. And I can guarantee you almost every successful person out there, regardless of their nationality, has a coach. They may not see it as a coach, they may call them an advisor, but it's definitely a coach. And coaching is related to advising. It's not therapy. The therapist want to keep you on that couch for the rest of your life. The, the psychologist wants to, keep, uh, uh, wants to keep talking to you for the rest of your life, too. The psychiatrist wants to give you drugs. I don't, I don't subscribe to any of that. To me, it's all natural. And if I got a headache, guess what? I go, I'd rather take a nap than, than pop a pill. So the main thing that I want everyone to get from, from this today the main, the main takeaway is going to be awareness. I want you to kick up your awareness. Once you're aware, and once you start paying attention, more so than what you're currently doing, that's going to be a powerful state of, of mind for you. Okay? And, and it's through that process, through coaching tools and awareness and contemplating things and turning off the phones and turning off the TV, and, and, uh, and, and the turning all this other stuff this, that keeps the monkey brain going and being able to say, you know what, for the past 20 years, or I've been having bad relationships, you know, I keep attracting the same type of guy, why is that? But for the past 15 years, I keep getting these crappy jobs, why is that? For the past five years, I can't seem to get ahead in this one job, why is that? If so-and-so is doing blue head to me, or so-and-so, the other one doesn't like me. A lot of the stuff is made up by ourselves. There's nothing that's being done. We are creating it by thinking it into being. So just keep that in mind. Just keep in mind also, the sun shines for all of us. So it's time for us to get out there, use these coaching tools, use these, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these weapons to better our lives, okay? Question number one I want you guys to keep in the back of your mind as we're getting through this session today, why are you here? 
Why are you? Ask yourself. The type of coaching that I do, I call it empowerment coaching, not life coaching. Because the life coaches kind of tend to talk like this, and everything's going to be all right, and everything's going to be perfect. And I'm in your face. I'm like raw, because I'm, I'm, I represent this community. That's what I am. That's what's inside of me. So it's all good, but at the same time, it's realistic. And so empowerment coaching, to me, I don't really teach anybody anything unless they need me to teach them something. I got skills that I can impart with people, but that's not really the core job that I have. As an empowerment coach, my slogan is be all you can be by being all of who you already are. So what do I really do? I assess you. I take a look at you intuitively as well as through coaching tools, and I figure out what is it that's your core? What is it that you're about? And I help you kick up the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. So that's what an empowerment coach does. I empower you to take care of yourself and to take control of your own life. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm sure you have to wait. So keep that question in mind. This is the real reason why I believe you came today. I believe you came here because deep inside you're ready to break through some of your toughest barriers you may not even be aware of and invest the time and effort necessary to triumph in all areas of life. All areas of life. You reflect, laugh, maybe even cry. This is a safe space, by the way, guys and girls. If you want to cry, do so. Don't worry about who's here. The camera's pointing to the back of your head. Nobody's going to see who, who did anything, okay? And, and, and I'm very serious about that. I used to have a meditation group in Miami, which came out of I don't know where, inspiration. And let me tell you, people opened up their souls to me there. And I took that very seriously. And one member that one day came and started making fun of the other members, I ejected them right there. There's no space for that. Because if you guys trust me to, to help me, or to allow me to help you with this process, then I take it very seriously and I protect your, your space, your identity, and everything about you. So feel whatever you feel. We're, we're here to express feelings and emotions. So if you feel something, let it out. Don't worry about it, OK? This isn't Mari Povich. There's no cameraman's going to come up to you and, and stick a camera in your face. But I will be there as a safe uh, space for you, OK? <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about today. Coaching, self-analysis, the wheel of life, smart goals, Beliefs and programming, prejudices, the emotions, and forgiveness. That's a big one. Every time I get into that, tears start coming out. Fear and anxiety, auto-suggestion, meditation and prayer, and a basic mental program. Everyone here is going to leave today with some paper that you're going to be able to set up a basic plan for yourself to start going through this process. There's only so much we can do in two hours. How are you? Come on in and just sit here with the group. Thank you. So I want everybody to, to have these takeaways so that when you leave here, you got some basic tools to get started. The Wheel of Life is a basic tool. The, uh, the uh, Smart Goals is another basic tool. And whoever has experienced coaching before, maybe, maybe in a uh, business environment, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna um, recognize some of these tools because they're very basic and everyone goes through them. They're very elementary, okay? So, what is coaching? Does anybody here know what coaching is? A definition? Somebody? Yes. Okay, anything else? Hi, how are you? Come on and sit on this side, please. <laughs> okay. And we had another hand back there, too. Yes, ma'am. Mentoring? Yes. Okay, yes. I see a coach as someone who takes whatever it is that you're, you're wanting to do to create yourself into, and that person guides you. That's all I see a coach as. Is not going to make me into him. He's going to make me better at what I'm doing. Nice. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Teacher. A teacher. Okay. And there was somebody back there. Who was? It? 
Somebody raised the hand back there. It was there. vague, but I was going to say the same thing someone said. Not guidance. Guidance. Okay. Well, you're all right. How many times have you heard that? There's no right or wrong answer. What it isn't is easier to define. It's not therapy. It's not psychiatry. It's not psychology. Although you might use elements of those others in the process of coaching. Okay? This is the definition I like. And it happens to be from a coach. I think he's out in England or something. Even though coaching was kind of like originated here in the U.S., uh, England has taken a shine to it, and they're kind of outdoing us in the utilization of coaching. So coaching is about performing at your best through the individual or groups and private assistance of someone who will challenge, stimulate, and guide you to keep growing. It's kind of, kind of what each one of you said, right? Elements are all in there. Hi, let's Hi. Okay. Come on in. So, what types of coaching do you think there are? There's sports coaching. Who doesn't know about sports coaching? Right? And the word coach actually comes more, more in line with, uh, with the carriage, with the, with, where the horses were carried. And that then <coughs> got turned into bags. That's why you see that coach logo on the coach bags. But coaching is support. That's what it's about. It's carrying something, carrying something through or across. That's where the root word or, or, or the root usage of that word came from, from coach. So everybody knows sports coaching, business coaching. Um, how many people here know about business coaching? Yeah, a little bit more. Executive coaching related to the business coaching, but that's CEOs or VPs of companies that, are, that want to, uh, to, to perform at a higher level. Then of course we got life coaching. We have team coaching, career coaching, and in everything else. How many people here are actors? Any actors in the room? Performers? No. Not even one. That's oh, you're back there, sir. Huh? We have one. one on. Yeah. So anyone, anyone that's a, that's a performer, if you guys have uh, siblings or, or relatives that are performers, most of them have coaches. And especially when they start getting really high up in their career, they definitely have coaches. Because that's how they maintain that. Very competitive, as you know. So relationship coaching, that's a fun one, right? We can always use a little bit of, bit of that. Huh? Health coaching. What other kind of coaching? Come on in, guys, on this side. Any other type of coaching that you can think of? Financial coaching. Financial coaching. Coaching children. Huh? Coaching children. Coaching children. So you see that there's a whole world of coaching out there. But that process, it has its fundamentals, and then you can customize it as per the particular field that you have an interest in. And I encourage you here, everyone that's here, to maybe consider becoming a coach. Because if you guys, you answered earlier, most of you raised your hand when I asked if a lot of people come to you asking for advice all the time, or for guidance. And that's really at the, at the heart of, of a natural coach. Because there's people that can just go to school and learn anything. And that's not the type of coach that I'd like to be, because that's a, that's a person that might as well just be a lecturer up here, just talking to you. A real coach to me is somebody that has empathy with the person that he's coaching, that can connect on an emotional level. That's far more important. And the specific type of coaching that I, that I, uh, that I learned and that I practice is over 2,000 years old. It's based on the Socratic method from Socrates. So it's really asking questions. Asking questions. It gets annoying sometimes with some people, but it's definitely powerful because it makes people think about their situation. Check it out. You can't change what's going on around you until you start changing what's going on within you. Think about it. <laughs> How are you? So imagine you're 25, 5, 6, and for the next six oh, months, six, no. several times a day, you eat lots of snacks, pizza, cheeseburgers, potato chips, fried foods, <laughs> drinks, and soda. You play video games all day, never exercise, and you have insomnia. So what do you think? You, you think you have a normal weight? You think you'll be overweight or seriously ill? Seriously ill, right? What is this a wrong way of sharing with you? That what you do, you're in control of your own life. You're the driver of your car, not somebody else. 
you're the one with the power. So if you do all these things, you're going to get a cause and effect. You're going to get a result of that, which is you're going to be overweight or probably deathly ill. That's easy to understand, right? This is very simplified. But guess what? We do this every single day. We're reckless with ourselves, we're reckless with our emotions, we're reckless with our actions, and we're reckless with our habits. It's just human nature. There's no judgment. I'm not here to judge you. Don't judge each other and don't judge yourselves. Again, the main thing that I said earlier that I want you guys to take away is awareness. To be aware. Because once you're aware, that gives you a chance to start applying tools like what we're going to learn today to change these things. That's the whole point. So awareness is the number one thing. And I trust, trust me that once you start picking up the awareness, it's like a Pandora's box. It doesn't shrink. It keeps expanding. And that just leads to other things that you start noticing about yourself that you want to change. That make sense? Everybody awake? All right. How's this for self-analysis? Women. What do you think here, women? That's that's a you know that's a bogus magazine cover, but it says a lot of stuff in there that we have to deal with. I, I grew up with two sisters, and I've heard it. I've had I've heard all the stories that they can tell with their parents. But the main thing is stuff like this. If my if my family came over and asked me and my brother how many girlfriends we had, we had to say you know two, three, four, whatever. My sisters, ask my sisters, how many boyfriends do you have? If they said one or more, forget about it. It's a double standard, right? I grew up in a machista family, like most of us did. Some of us still are. So I had to undo all of that stuff because I saw that it, it didn't make sense. It wasn't congruent with how I felt inside. It was just something I learned from somebody else, and I was applying it because that's, that's when you learn it, and you absorb it that way, especially from, in, from childhood that starts to become your program. So look at this. How many women today, as they were getting ready to come here today, were fussing about all this stuff that's on you? Be honest, this is a safe space. I see you smiling back there. That's right. See, one brave lady raised her hand. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Who else? Seriously, ladies. You all got a smile on your face. Now, guys, this is what guys see when they look in the mirror. <laughs> They're like this. But when they look in the mirror, this is the reflection. <laughs> now, why is it that when women look in the reflection, this is what they see? Big turkey leg there. <laughs> but that's it's the truth. It's, it's bizarre. And again, growing up with two sisters, it, it, it seemed like so bizarre to me that this is what they would see. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, hey, you look, you look great. Yeah, you know, you got it going on for tonight. But their, their self-image is this. Yes? Do you think that women are winning? No. So that women have to look more fertile, ready to carry children to That woman was fertile to you? <laughs> well, she was thinking she would be pregnant with her. <laughs> well, this this looks like a brush or two. I don't know what she has there, but this looks like a turkey leg. So I think is the reflection. Why is she providing for a wife? And yet, I mean, obviously, the ones on the other side have a couple. But I'm saying it to to explain why men see themselves that way versus why women see themselves over, you know. I, I don't know, but I don't think so. Yes, sir. I just think that women are a little bit more over, overly critical of themselves, of their self-image, than you're men getting, are. You're getting warmer to what I believe. What I, yes? I think it's the media, and I think it's very uh, cultural, because in other countries, women are, you know, they, they weigh more, they have more curves, and it's okay. Over here, they want us to look like a, like a top model. And in reality, that's what it's supposed to I think the... Uh, the, the average size in this country is 14. I don't know what a 14 is, but it sounds big. That's what they want, yes. that's what they want but the reality is what they make you feel. Yes, sir. I think women are a little more emotional, therefore a little more critical about their appearances. That's, wow, this is a hot, you see a hot button. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why women have to I can't 
There's no right or wrong answer here, by the way. I mean, I think it is probably true that the media now is trying to move us away from the image of a very blurry woman. But the reason I say it might be Darwinian is because the previously before women entered the legal profession, they were seen as women. Yes. And now they're seen as women. And 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 they're
Right. So you have to define what you want. And I'm going to give you those tools today. It's very basic tools so that you can leave here with a roadmap or at least know what you have to do so you can start building your personal roadmap to your fulfillment and happiness. And money isn't the only thing that can make people happy. In fact, I know a lot of extremely wealthy people that are miserable. Okay, so let's get that one out, out in the open and understand when I ask people what makes you happy, right away most of us say money. Well, guess what? It's what you do with that money. It's not the money itself. So we have another person there. I just wanted to say that I, I am a baby boomer age, um, and so our family, yeah, I don't even have to use Go ahead and use the mic, because I can't hear you. You don't look a day over 20, by the way. <laughs> That's nice, thank you. But um, we came from homes where we had both parents. And, and, so, and they listened to us. And so that was, the focus was on family. What has happened is that we have gotten further and further away from the family composition. And we are, and, we're go into and, and, and they have family. fractured, they have fractured. Right. That family, you know, uh, that the, the power of, of being, you know, a, a, a family. Right. And so, um, and then they, they fed us, and it was taboo. A lot of the things back then, it was, it was just kept secret because that's the way it was. It, they, they, they honored the fact that you didn't want to speak about everything. Now, everything that you do is exposed. It's out there for everyone to criticize. And so that belittles people, and so, so they feel that they have to conform to what, uh, what, what their idea is of what we should be. Yeah, it's and like so, a peer pressure. Yeah, and they take it away, they take the focus away from who we are. So I admire those women who, regardless of whatever, stay true to themselves and do not let themselves be influenced by what everybody else thinks that you should be. And so I think, and so there are some women who have been like that, and those are my role models, like my mom. So to me, she was everything. She only had third grade uh, education. But if she had been able to go all the way to the top, I can't imagine what she would have been. Right. Um, and, and so I don't have a problem being what I am, and if I had to live over again, I want to come back exactly how I am, warts and all. I have no problems with being who I am. So, you, we you know, have that's just it. And then we have to move on. Um, you're right, you're right. Well, you know, I just think comments like, you don't look at the damn funny reinforces the paradigm that women are stuck with. What's wrong with looking 75? I mean, the idea that youth is valuable for your physical looks and that age is valuable for your wisdom, I mean, we've got to flip that. Women are stuck in that. Whether we look at the woman on the right as fertile or the weight, whatever, yes, her health is important, but why is it wrong that she looks that way? We're I mean, I think conversations like this ultimately are distraction. Yes, women want to feel good, they want to look good, that's great. But I think that it hinders women's ability to succeed in whatever path yes. they choose by focusing on how they look, whether it's to make them feel better or not. Right. Do we have time for two more? I have a male perspective. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then we go with Diane up here. Okay. I, I just wanted to share, um, to share that I disagree that it's the media's fault because the media is an influencer in this paradigm. You know, right. it's, it's, they're not telling you what choices to make in terms of lifestyle, in terms of exercise. Well, in terms of we're going to get to that. Uh, you know, you may, you may not think It's an influencer. Yeah. So it, it, it's, I think there's room for self-choice. I'm a woman and I get dressed up every day to go to work. I wear makeup and I like it. I like reading magazines. There's magazines for all types of women and all different stages of life and perspectives. So it's like you make that choice. But I don't think that it's fair to sit and just blame the conglomerate of the media. That's just my <clears throat> I believe that your early influences, your family, is what shape up who you think you are and who you think you will be. And unfortunately, if you come from a dysfunctional family, you grow up like that, thinking certain things about yourself. Then it gets to a point, when you get a little older, that you have to erase many of those tapes that were put in your mind to be able to progress and, and then choose which way 
you know, the ones that they and just, that's what we're here to do. Can I just say one more thing yeah. and then that's it for me? I think as a teacher I learned this. The first the first powerful uh, uh, part of your education comes, as he just said, from uh, your home. And then you get the second part of it, it's in three phases. The first is the home, that's the basic foundation. The second part is what you get from textbooks in school, and the last part you get from the streets. And you have to combine all three of those in order to come up with a winning combination. You have to, because you have to interact with people to get, and you see, you observe, you watch, and then you make choices from those three. But the most important one is what you get at home. Self-esteem. Just, just one question for you. We're dying and then we have to move on. Uh, I just want to ask you, um, did you choose to do this today because it's International Women's Day? Yes. Did you know that? Did you know that? Oh, Anderson, I didn't pick the day for me. <laughs> well, happy well, Women's Day, day all my ladies. Wait, wait, wait. Let's hear the woman more. Uh -huh. <laughs> We got one more with Diana, and then we have to move on. Right here. Well, I just wanted to say I have four kids. Um, my oldest is 21. My youngest is eight. Um, that for me has nothing to do because I started gaining weight or didn't lose the weight after my fourth child. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't really think that has nothing to do with fertile. It just it's just more of. Um, your metabolism, and uh, the other thing is that it has nothing, it, it's about oneself, how you perceive what's going on around you, what you want, yes, absolutely. Um, because even, you know, in my, in my grandmother's household, my grandmother, you know, to death do us part, uh, was the theme song in my grandparents, both of my grandparents' families. Uh, my mother and my father were they divorced when I was really young. So, but that doesn't take away her answers. It's what you perceive and what you want forward. That's right. Well, thank you. Thank you. So let's move on here. Okay. Continue with self-image. This kid doesn't have a problem. It's like, like, that's like the uh, previous image with the man, right? He looks in the mirror and you got to be a friend. So it's about self-image and cultivating you. Now, you have one of your sheets that you have there, and we're going to come back to this, but one of the sheets you have here is the life here. And we're going to come back to this, but basically I want you at the top of the pie, here I'm going to show you if you have something to write with. Right in that first line there, besides putting in your name and date, which you can do later, I want you to put in this slice of the pie there, in this line here, career. Career. Yeah. You don't have a sheet? I don't have a pen. Okay, on the next one, the next one here, we're going to put money. This one here. This first one here, this first slice right there is career. Can you see that red dot? Yes. Okay. This next one here is money. The next one below it is health. <coughs> next after that is family and friends. Then we have romance or significant others in this one. Here we have personal growth and learning. Personal growth and learning. The one before that is romance. Okay, then we have fun, leisure, and recreation. And the last one is physical environment. Again, a very basic tool, the life wheel, covers eight of the core areas of most people's lives. So we're going to come back and go and do an exercise with this in a little bit, but I just want you guys to do that. Okay.
Can you go back and just repeat all of them one more time, please? Career is the first one, right up here. Career, right? Here we have money. Here we have health. Next we have family and friends. Come on on this side, please. Then we have significant other and romance. On this one. Here, personal growth and learning. Fun, leisure, and recreation. On this one. And then physical environment. Remember, the first set, the thing that I said that's the main takeaway from today, for today, is this. Awareness. Increase your self-awareness and accept responsibility for what your self-assessment or life wheel finds you need to work on to bring harmony and fulfillment into your life. Thank you. These exercises, some of them are painful. They bring up a lot of stuff. They can bring up hidden, hidden trauma, uh, emotions, and things that you didn't even know were there. And that's why I keep saying that this is a safe space, so if you feel something come up, let it out. That's what we're here for, is to help you get to, to that level. But that awareness there is what's gonna help you, because that's gonna start increasing, and that's what's gonna help you address and look at these things head on and be able to do something about them. Or seek some other help. Coaching is not 100% for everybody. Some people do need therapy. Some people do need psychiatry. You'll be able to make that determination. We were saying earlier that computers are modeled after humans, and uh, we'll go we'll, we'll go deeper into it for least, But you see that um, unfortunately, when I typed in Google looking for these images, this was a very symbolic picture to me because I said, "How come?" I didn't find any pictures of a uh, chocolate covered baby on a computer. But think about it. Where we've been in our community has been disenfranchised. And for years ago, by maybe 15 years ago, there was that digital divide that Latinos and blacks didn't have computers and didn't have the money, da, 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 all that other stuff. Well, these things are sometimes perpetuated by the media and by the status quo. So when you look at something like this, when I'm Googling for images to, to uh, complete this slide, I said, man, you know, I can't find a Latino baby on a computer. I can't find, and I know we are, we're, we are the number one users of smartphones. Yes. No, I think for, I think ad agencies are just choosing to, to promote yeah. these images. With SEO, which is a, what you can pay someone to do. So if your company wanted to take Latino babies and propagate that image, you probably hire someone to do the search engine optimization for your company with that image. I definitely agree with that. I, I used to own an internet company, so I, I know exactly what you were speaking on. My point with this is, and this is just a personal observation, my point with this is that the status quo is not interested in promoting those images. We have to do it ourselves. And again, that's at the heart of this, of this uh, session today, which is empowerment for yourself. That's why I said empower your hour. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. I don't have more than you, you don't have more than me. So what makes one person stand out or more successful than the other? is what you do with that 24 hours. If you spend it watching mindless TV programs or stuff that you TiVo, I'm not knocking any of that. Again, it's not criticism. But you gotta understand that if those are what your actions are, don't complain when you're not getting the results that you're looking for, that you're fantasizing about, because you're not being congruent, okay? Prejudices, where do they come from? That's right. Nobody, this kid looks like he loves his friend. Love, absolutely loves his friend. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful expression there. Okay? And nobody ever told him that he could not love his friend because his friend is white. And nobody told this white kid that he could not hug and love both of his black friends. 
It's learned. How do you know he's black? You could be Puerto Rican. That's the problem we have. Yeah. You come with it. I you just assume. Don't assume. What's the problem? I am 65 years old, and I have lived for 65 years having to deal in a society that only gives me the image of black or white. It's just recently. From this generation, my kid was now in college. <clears throat> I have four, the only daughter I have, who's brown, is now dealing with, where am I? And we've been telling her, and our son, who's the oldest, 31, that we live in a world that's composed of three. It's not just white, and it's not just black. Because the Native Americans were here before anybody. Yeah, yeah. that's true. I'm sorry, and emotional. That's good. Okay, let it out. We need some tissue, by the way. All right, so. It's all good. Your conscious mind runs the beliefs stored in your subconscious mind the same way a computer runs programs stored in its hard drive. That's what we're talking about. Okay, that stuff is been put in there by all of these sources. Any of them look familiar? Think about it, huh? Where's what? This is in no particular order, but it would probably, for our community, probably be up here if we were to do it in, you know, order of, uh, of indoctrination or something, like when we were first exposed to it. The reality. Who here still believes in Santa Claus? <laughs> Why is that? We'll talk therapy later about that. I believe in magic, but I don't know if I believe in Santa Claus. So, authority figure plus programming equals belief. Who likes math here? There's a formula. Authority figure plus programming equals belief. You, this one missing there. In my opinion. Sure, you can have Respect. Where I don't is know, it? I had another slide that said more down here. I don't know what I want to do. Oh. Respect, you said? Yes. 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 You, can pro yes. You, you can program using respect as your foundation. Oh, and, absolutely. And, 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 and everything else yeah. kind of falls into place because at that point, you know, this is what you have to teach kids when they come into school. You have to teach them to respect differences, right. whatever and those differences still, may be, but I don't see it. I guess a clinical term for it would still be this. They see it as somebody with a power over them to, to give them instruction, guidance, information, uh, love, food, shelter, all of that. There's trust in that person. Mm -hmm. and, and, once, and, and it doesn't always have to be love. It, it could be you know, um, somebody that's abused as well. But once they see in, in their psyche, uh, if they see that person as this, that leads to the programming, which creates a belief. Okay? Any questions? Yes, sir. Culture and tradition. I'm sorry? Culture and tradition. Yeah. Absolutely. And that could be in there, in family, friends, but yes, all of these things. So now, guess what? You're thinking about this now, right? Because you're coming up with additional things to add to this list. And that's the whole point, is to start kicking up your awareness, expanding that awareness, and you start realizing, wow, the only reason why I brush my teeth this way, even though I'm a righty, is because mom used to tell me that, that, that I couldn't use the other hand, or whatever. It's a conditioning, it's a programming. So once you start becoming aware of it, you can change it to your advantage. You gotta know what you wanna change it to. <laughs> <laughs> These are the first VCRs, right? Those are the first iPods or whatever. They, they record everything, everything. Even when you think they're sleeping, they're recording everything. And that was very nice, if that's how this happened. Then I noticed who was watching. That's awareness. Noticing is awareness. He realized right there that he's responsible for what this person learns here. Yep. Yes, sir. That's so true. Um, last night I was with my daughter, and um, she makes certain noises and certain sounds, 
and I made a new sound. I forgot what it, I think it was like a certain cough or a certain it was like a, a yawn and she right she just turned around, looked at me and imitated the same exact sound. I was like, I've never heard her say that before <laughs> or do that. She just I think it was like a yawn or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my god <laughs> I didn't think that they were recorded that you didn't think they're, they're they even it them. was instant. It was like she was doing something else, she just turned around and made the same exact noise that I did. <laughs> it's a big sponge in there, just absorbing everything through all the five senses, plus the emotions and the vibrations that you're transmitting. Because if you're upset while you're cleaning their diaper or whatever, they're feeling that too. You know, if you're under your breath, you're, you're cursing and doing whatever, they're, they're getting that too, they're recording that too. And guess what? This is the worst time to do that because you can, you can traumatize a, a kid. It's four to seven years old. After seven is when they start getting the, the skin starts getting a little tougher. But prior to that, man, it's, that's a sponge right there that's absorbing everything. All right, come on in. You become like the final <coughs> people you spend the most time with. So choose carefully. Think about it. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> It's easier to build strong children, like we're saying, right, than to repair broken men. Because once you're grown, you're grown. Then it's harder. It's, it's tougher. And yeah, then you might have to do some therapy. A lot of wisdom. Yeah. A lot of our brothers and sisters that are in jail. There's nothing wrong with them. They hurt. They, they, they didn't feel some love. They're missing some love. Or, or you know, they were traumatized as, as children. Lots of stuff that happened in our communities. And guess what? You know, they're not being treated in there. They're not being coached in there. So think about it. Well, I just also want to add to all of this that, um, you know, we came from a society where there was racism and prejudice from early on. And the, and the horrible things that, that occurred, not just to African Americans, to people in general is, is something that has brought us to what we are now and I think it's a shame because racism and prejudice is alive and well in this country. Absolutely. Alive First time well. I went to, uh, at age 14, I went to North Carolina. I was, uh, what, in ninth grade. First question the kid asked me in school, what are you, white or black? <laughs> And I've never been asked that question. Yeah. So I said neither. And I don't know why they include it on applications when you go to apply for a job, for college or whatever. They actually have, so what are you? Are you African American? Are you this? Are you that? I, don't, I, I never answer that question because it doesn't matter who I am. Am I qualified for the job? That's the only thing that should interest you, not what color I am. Yes, sir. So, um, just to, to piggyback on her, I, I agree That's with her. Uh, sorry? Go ahead, it's all oh. back. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I agree with her in concept, but um, back in the 60s and 70s, when they first started creating those forms, other multicultural societies decided not to um, analyze that data. So in France, for example, they had the same concept and they decided to not analyze the data. Fast forward 30, 40 years, they are having huge problems in terms of understanding the, the concept between race and so forth because they didn't collect the data back then. So even though I agree with her, I also think because this society is so racially based, we now have a leg up over other societies because we've been collecting this data for years and years. It's the only reason that we're able to, to deal with these problems because we have data that says, you know, black people are stopped more often than white and um, the marijuana and the uh, drug enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, all, all these things. We now have solutions for it, but the only reason is because all of this information has been gathered over time, um, where in other countries, they it's don't... It's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. That's, that's a good point. I think that's great. And it's I think a double-edged that, sword. We have another question yes. here. Go ahead, uh, Sometimes I see, a lot of times Latinos are not considered a race, 
So you would see Latino black, Latino white, white Latino mm -hmm. non white. Mm -hmm. And if I see black and white, okay. I'll create my own box and I'll just check yes. all the names. Yes. Yeah. yeah, where they have names. Where they say other. You have a sheet in your page here, four values. We've been talking about this. You didn't get this one? No. No. It's all, it's, yeah, it's one of So, Estella's coming around with it. Yeah, sorry. It's okay. We're going to do a little exercise with that. Whole values, and again, there's no right or wrong. We're not here to judge. If your core, core values that were instilled in you as a child were that it was okay to to, to steal from from people, uh, that it was okay to lie, that it was okay to cheat, then those are your core values. I'm not going to judge you about that. That's what was instilled in you. That was what was programmed. In you. I may not agree with it, but I have no right to say those are wrong. They may be wrong in society, but it's up to you to change them. This exercise and this sheet is to start triggering these things, these things that, that start to kind of form a profile of, you, of who you are, so that you can look at yourself in the mirror and look at this sheet, and this sheet all of a sudden represents you and your core battle. You had a question? Well, so not necessarily a question. I mean, so it's more of a statement. Part of it's, so I partly disagree with the last thing that you made in terms of it's not my responsibility or it's not up to me to have that be different. I feel like if there are, if there are, four, and we talk about, we just talk about a lot about racism and stuff like that, right? Right. And so racism is inherently built, well, not inherently, but it's, it's, you said it's programmed in people. And so this becomes their core value, right? It's that, and that's the piece. Now, I feel, you know, in terms of accountability and responsibility, it's up to me to have that be different. Because sometimes it's awareness, right? Sometimes they're not aware that this core value may be a negative component in the world that they live in because that's what they were raised with, right? They think that's the, that's the positive, that's what life should be, that's how, it, you know, that's the way the world operates. And if we don't raise the awareness around that, we don't say something and say, stop, that this is wrong, this is not how it should be because it can be different because inherently we're, we're equal. If we talk about we the are thing all about the same. It is, but there's challenges, but there's like you go to other cultures, other countries, and they'll have a different standard. So what do we do? Do we impose ours on them? I'm not saying I'm imposing. I'm talking about if there's power in education and awareness. And so if we can give people different, right, different insight, different awareness, we give different right, information to pull from, it's only feedback. You can do what you want with it. Right. But it, it, it does, I think it does, it's incumbent upon us to sit there and say something because if we don't, we continue to see this like, cycle perpetuate around again, we see the world that we live in. Because a lot of times people turn around and say, it's not up to me to say something, it's not up for me to sit there, you know, it's, it's for them to figure out. When it's in reality, they might never figure out because they might not even be aware there's an issue. That's true. That's exactly right. And, that, and again, that's why we're using these exercises to draw awareness to it so that you have a chance to change them yourself. You had another question over Well, I mean, I think I see like the equation of always being a plus program and equal beliefs, or it's the equal beliefs and equal beliefs. And I think so, you know, the, the, the question about the census, that's the U.S., you know, Department of Census, the Department of Chamber of Commerce, the authority figure that's telling us these are the important categories in our life. Right. And that's where, it, and, and it can be both harm, useful or harmful, depending on who then becomes the authority figure down the road. Right. So I, I think that, you know, it, it's an interesting exercise to identify which authority figures have control over which beliefs in our life. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a, you know, everyone, everyone wants to have a piece of your brain and of your soul. You know, think about it. The church wants a piece, wants a cut. The government wants a cut. The schools want a cut. You go on the subways now. What's all on the subways? You know, go to school. ASA, whatever that school is, of all these schools that popped up out of nowhere. The economy goes down. They say, go back to school. Spend some more money. Meanwhile, I know, I, I can't tell you how many MBAs that I know that are making minimum wage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and still have the bills from their schooling. I'm not against schooling, but I myself am a college dropout. And I did try to go back to college several times, and guess what? It didn't work out because I was, I was redoing classes that I had done in high school, and I got frustrated. I was learning more from the jobs that I had. So you got guys like Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates that dropped out of school as well. 
So it's not a guarantee to anything. I'm um, pro education, though. Not necessarily traditional, formal higher education. Because some of that is, is just, you know, throw up for the brain. Yes. I, I agree with you, but I do think that sometimes, like, it's those types of things open up your eyes for a lot of things. Because I was a sociology major, so we had a lot of those controversies. I don't think we can hear you back here. But for me, that was very eye opening, and it helped me. Can you give me this time? Thank you. Um, I was just saying that I agree with your perspective, but I also think that for some of us, the formal education setting of, or higher education setting is, is important. Um, and I'm not against it. I want to be no, clear. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying do not do it. I'm mm -hmm. pro education and higher education. But what I, what, where I was going was that um, I was a sociology major and we had a lot of these conversations in the classroom and I went to a school that where I was like one in, you know, it was a, a very um, middle class and, you know, not very heterogeneous school. <laughs> so um, for me, it helped me kind of identify myself and become aware of, of just the context that I grew up in and try to self-identify. Um, so I thought that for me, that, that was very important to kind of open up my eyes of how I perceived myself. We have one more question and then we're going to do the exercise. Go ahead. I just want to state that, you know, you stand do up, have Stand up, stand up. I just want to state that you do have people that are academically biased, okay? Because they feel then that if you don't have an MBA or PhD, they feel like you're, they're more superior over yourself. And, and I agree with him because, you know, at the end of the day, it's your experiences and life experience is much more than you having a PhD that you don't have no experience for. You're not going to get hired. I wouldn't hire somebody. I, I mean, I dropped out of college for financial reasons. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was NYU, and I couldn't afford the 40 grand a year even back then. And I, I joined the military thinking, hey, they're going to pay for the education. Guess what? It didn't work out that way. The military, what they were doing at the time was, you would go, once you would leave the military, you would apply for, for that program, which was a reimbursement program. So you still had to come out of pocket for it, and then wait to get reimbursed, and I didn't have the money. But I've always, I read an article about, um, remember that guy, um, Helmsley? You guys, you guys remember the name Helmsley? Not the owner, his, his wife, but the, uh, I forgot what his first name is. But I remember reading an article about this guy, Helmsley how he only had a third grade education. And he died a billionaire. And he was the owner of the Helmsley Palace and he died and he, uh, he married the owner of Helmsley and all of that stuff. So, but what was it about this article that made me feel at least a little bit better? Because I, at first I was feeling shame that I had to leave college, you know, but what, my parents didn't have the money and all the grant, help grants in the world weren't gonna cover it. So after, after I got over that and I read that article, I realized one of the things it said there was he had a third grade or fourth grade education, something like that, but he went to take what they called back then elective courses, which today I call seminars and conferences, so that you can get accelerated learning and, and teaching. And again, it's not for everybody. Some people really thrive, and, and, I, and, and my suggestion is that most people should go through the formal education system, because there's a lot of values. And, and my point is only that it's not 100% across the board for everybody. And some of the, the higher learning places that do a disservice to, to some people, like I said, like these people that I know that have those MBAs and they're making minimum wage, they, they got taught more than likely by people that are just lecturers and not doers. Because I guarantee you, if you get mentored by a successful business person, you're gonna learn to uh, the stuff that you can apply right away. It's not gonna be all theory and all this other stuff that you can apply. Yes? I, I just need to get back to, because you triggered me off, you know, because you said, when you get triggered, right? Don't express me. You triggered me off because I was looking at core values and self-esteem. I have a daughter. I pay fifty-two thousand dollars a year. Same issue that you're talking about. Private, brown, okay? Entering second year, dealing with racism that I didn't even deal with. I'm telling you, we talk about education, higher education. I'm an educator. Because I haven't told you what I do. I'm an educator. From the 60s, okay, 65. And I dealt with Alabama, dad gets off the bus, 
Mom gets off the bus, that can go right, mom can't. And I'm in between. So you can imagine how traumatic I am. And she, nobody speaks English. But my parents never spoke a word of English. I have a daughter in today's society where I'm paying this mom tuition, and I'm dealing with poor values of the dominant group who is attacking the self-esteem, not in my group, because I got a whole stack of what they call Baldwin scholarship students from our grassroots communities who are being bombarded with how different they are, how they cannot speak, because they're, they're letting them in knowing that they might not succeed because our elementary school education is not educated. Oh my God, I gotta stop talking. Because you got me. I'm so sorry. Well, that's what I'm saying. So I have to deal. You cannot imagine. Time out, baby. We got one more question here, and then we have to continue with the presentation. We're running out of time. I'm sorry. One more. Yes. sheets now? All right, so I'm going to give you five minutes to fill out the values list as much as you can. If you don't get through the whole thing, it's okay. But do the best you can, okay? Yeah, one each. Okay. 
Four minutes. No, that's for you. All of this stuff is for you guys. Okay, <laughs> back to school. One minute. It's okay if you don't finish. You're taking these pa these uh, papers, <coughs> and and again, this is gonna stir stuff up. You might get home. You might wake up from you know from a, a dream or a nightmare tomorrow with, uh, with an epiphany. Seriously. Because this stuff, coaching, when it's effective, works on your subconscious. It digs deep. Stuff that you don't even know is there sometimes will come up. And I'm a really good coach. <laughs> Never make someone a priority when all you are to them is an option. Does anybody have any relationships like that? I think that It's like when somebody says you're my best friend, but or when you feel they're your best friend, but they're not, but you're not theirs, right? It's like you're an option. That sucks. Yeah. That hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Teaching that to children. You saw all the programming. The kids, they suck it up. They can't help but do that. It's a survival mechanism. The only limitations one has are the ones that they place on themselves. Pandora's box. I like working with a lot of mnemonic devices, metaphors, things like that. Pandora's box. Today you're opening your Pandora's box. You're going to let it out. You're going to process emotions, fears, anxiety, belief systems. You're going to challenge belief systems that you've held your entire life. Don't go home and beat up your husband or, 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 or wife <laughs> or your parents. Don't go calling your parents. You know, I'm not. Like, I got a sister that's, that claims to this day, she's in her 60s, that she's fat because my mom fed her too much. <laughs> so what was my mom supposed to do, starve her? Then what? Then it's another issue. So this is about getting rid of those excuses and those things, those self-limiting beliefs and those things that we keep telling ourselves because they're, they're not true. They're only true if you make them true. And if they no longer serve you, if they served you at one time, like believing in Santa Claus served you at one time. Believing in the tooth fairy served you at one time. I don't think it does today for most of us. So if it doesn't, it, change it. Change it. You have that power. That's what I want to share with you guys here, is to introduce you to yourself. Yes. Program. You like that part, right? <laughs> Two words. Make a choice. Decide which one that you want to subscribe to. That's it. Because you are in control. So if their program doesn't suit you, look for one that does and use that one. 
that shoe's too tight, stop pretending you're a six if you're a seven. Yeah, exactly. Put on that damn shoe yeah. seven. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's how you're going to thrive. Otherwise, you're going to have a situation where you're, where you're always trying to please someone else. You're always trying to gratify someone else instead of yourself. And that, that can't be self-love that way. Yes, sir. Uh, you got to know my name. That's dangerous. Um, I think that before any presentation is made to the public, and again, I'm not imposing my opinion on anyone. This is my opinion. You have to open it up anywhere, be it the President of the United States, the Pope, whoever, should always open up by stating that there are exceptions to every rule and that those exceptions are okay because I think that people live their lives thinking that things have to happen at certain times and they forget about that 5% margin that you have to leave for the unexpected because those are the ones that really throw you for a loop and then what do you do when you think that this is the way something should have been and then it turns out not to be. I think people need to really uh, concentrate on that, that there's a 5% margin. You say, well, why did that happen? Because that's the way it is. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a big one. If, if we're still dealing with authority yes. figures, wait till we get into emotions and forgiveness. So we're running out of time. We only got maybe another 30 minutes or so left. So we got to keep moving. But I promise you that you're going to leave here with those tools to be able to go home and process a lot of the stuff. And all it takes is a commitment from you and a decision from you to say, I'm going to do this. I'm not happy with this in my life, whatever that is that you're going to get from the life field, right? I'm not happy with these things. What do I need to do to start improving on those areas? And you have my contact information. It's on there and it's going to be on the screen. So email me. It's empoweryourhour at gmail.com. It doesn't get any easier than that. And I will respond to you. And I'm not going to charge you a penny. Okay? Because I believe in you guys. And again, I'm not here to impress you with what I did in my past. Although it, it impressed me up to a certain point because I come from nothing. I come from a poor family. I come from a, a college dropout background. And I did achieve some things. So I'm proud of that. But I'm more impressed by you guys. Because I know that I was given a gift to connect with you guys to help you achieve what you're, what you're looking to achieve. And that's what I want to empower you. That's why I chose that name, Empower Your Hour. Okay? Tell me, what do you feel when you look at these images? We're going to have a series of images. Look at that image very carefully. What's a matador? Matador. It seems it's as if the bull is is talking to this guy. Look at that. No, I don't think he's saying he's doing it. I think he's saying, what the hell are you doing? Why are you killing me? What did I do to you? That's why this guy is killing Right? Emotions, right? Powerful shit. Look at that. So powerful that he must have had an entire stadium of people going, yeah, and look at this animal broke him down to that. This is a true story. I forget what the guy's name is, but you can look this up on Google. What happened? This guy then became an animal lover and an advocate for Because let me tell you guys, what happened to the book? He had an aha moment. He became aware. He rose up. His spirituality went to another dimension and he realized that that animal is the same as him. It's a creature that belongs on this earth as well. 
and he realized it. That's realization, self-realization. So he felt guilt, he felt embarrassed, he felt ashamed, he felt remorse, because he's killing a helpless animal. The animal, yes, yeah, chasing him because he's pissing him off. He's yes. waving the red uh, whatever in front of him, and they, you know, lo están cucando. Yes. Of course the bull chases him. Try to, try to go to any wild animal out there and, and mess with them and see what's going to happen. They have to defend themselves. Us, we go out in the street and have a total stranger come and get in our face. What are we going to do? We defend ourselves. So the animal is just reacting to, to, to stimulus that this guy and all those other people is providing. But you know what? He had a moment, he had an aha moment. Yes, sir. In the bullfighting, you, you, you got to stab the bull with the sword. Yeah. And it looks like there's like more than one in there. Yeah. And as a bullfighter, that would be special because he's supposed to incise with the sword. And you're inflicting more harm on the right. bull because he's using more sword. That's right. It's torture, isn't it? Yeah. He's torturing that animal. So it's looking like he became more compassionate as he looks at Pain, Great work, compassion. And, he's still not and that's the three C's that I want you guys to write this down to the three C's. That's not on the slides that I want you guys to always practice on a daily basis. Three C's. Compassion. Compassion. Consciousness. And consideration. I guarantee you, if you practice, if you're mindful of those three things on a daily basis, on your interactions, across the board with everybody, whether it's your your crappy boss or it's your sibling that you hate or whatever, it doesn't matter. Practice those three C's, you're gonna be a transformed and changed person. I guarantee you. Awareness. To be aware. To be conscious that you have a responsibility to yourself to practice the other two C's. What emotion do you see there? Unconditional love. That's an animal. So we're thinking, you know, people sometimes, there are people out there that think that animals don't have feelings. Maybe not on the level that we are, I don't know, physiologically speaking, I don't know. But it looks like love to me. <laughs> Otherwise, if, 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 this, if this animal saw this one as a threat, what would he do? That's right, kill him, eat him. These are not posts for pictures, man. These are not models and actors. It's natural habitat photos. <laughs> Nothing more innocent than these two together, right? But I love the dog. I'm going to get a dog right after the show. He's going to start, pro start programming the dog by training him. He's going to start programming the kid by just influencing him. Just raise him. By the way, before we continue, I have to remind you, we do have a raffle. The fundraising committee. The set is heading that up, and I would like you guys to participate. If you didn't do so last week, or if you want to continue to do so this week, please do. We have enough bodies here that I think we can uh, we can give back. It's about giving back to the Latino leadership and all the hard work that Jaime and his team has has done to empower each and every one of you. I'm on the board as well. I'm the treasurer, and like I said, when when I was bitten by the bug of Jaime and the Latino Leadership Institute, I was like. I'm down for whatever. Just tell me what you need, and I've never gotten a penny. I don't want a penny. I want to help, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. There's some students here from the class that uh, that uh, that I was last in, and uh, and it, and it's all good. It's one of the best things that I've done in recent years, and I see that our community is going to make a difference moving forward. So I invite you all to please, before we leave today, to uh, to participate in the raffle. The set's going to happen. Right? You said?
Okay. You had a question? Go ahead. Did you reach the goal? No. We're, we're short of the goal, but I think today with, uh, with the number of people I see here, I think we can reach it. Or at least come very close. All right? Don't be shy, guys. I mean, I put, what, 20 or 30 bucks last week. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a dollar. It's what you choose. And we just ask them. If you don't, if you don't have anything to give, then don't give. It's okay. I don't know if this is a fake. So. <laughs> that doesn't look great. No, that's not good. That was from that was a, one of the first shots. Mm -hmm. A good relationship is when someone accepts your past, supports your present, and motivates your future. That sounds nice. I didn't come up with it. But it sounds nice. Those are hard to find. Yeah. But worth it. And by the way, I can send all this slide presentation to uh, to anyone if they, if they want it um, afterwards. <laughs> this is why that last slide matters. To this, right? Empathy, 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 belly. That's empathy too far. Too much empathy on the third side. <laughs> This one? Which one? This one? Yeah, that's a, too much empathy. <laughs> oh my god. He's got, he has more than six. He's too far, right? He's got 10 months. Here's the big one. How many people are feeling resentment, anger, hatred, disappointment, abandonment? It's locked up inside of your heart. A lot of us share with you today some tools on how to alleviate that. It's really up to you, because if you hold on to it, even after doing the exercises, nothing I say matters. Yes? Just want to say, it's true. Some people are so messed up, and their character is really messed up. Um, even though you may forgive that type of individual, some people you have to just stay away from. Because of who they are inside, yes. and no matter what, they're not going to change. They just, whatever, messed up. Uh, 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 whatever. So, how many of us here are prepared to do that? And to you make just those changes? Stay away from them. I mean, I, I don't, there's like people like I feel that way towards, but I don't hold a grudge towards them. If I saw them in the street and they needed my help, I would help them and keep it moving. Exactly. Because I know you're a messed up individual. Mm -hmm. You never want to. <laughs> You don't want to work on yourself, you're not going to change. So you can't forgive, but then in the process of getting some people, you know, their spirit, you just have to stay away from them. And read, read, read this part on the bottom here, because this is important. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Forgiveness is not about the other person. I hope you understand. <laughs> Forgiveness is about clearing out your vessel. That vessel is your heart. And just like a cup, this word cup and it's full of hatred and anger and bitterness and nothing else fits in there. Love definitely doesn't fit. You're not going to attract love. You're not going to attract any, anything good or positive or anything that will stay around for a while because your vessel is full of negative stuff. you got to empty it out and through these exercises you can do that. You can achieve that and it's called forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, and that's not, and, and you're not, there's nothing wrong with that. You can forgive them and then decide and make a decision to not have that person in your life. That's it. I've done that. Let it go. It's power. You're going to have power leaving out of here. But to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that prisoner was you. Think about that. It's for you. What's another way some people say uh, taking the poison and expecting the other person to die from it or something like that? Because you're the one thinking 
hateful thoughts against that person while that person is out on vacation in Hawaii, so living it up. And you're like, oh, you know, why? Let it go. We may not have time to complete this, but uh, I want you guys to close your eyes for a moment. If you've experienced meditation or not, I'm going to take you on a little guided meditation here. Totally intuitive, because this is, this is what I love. Put your books down, uncross your legs, put your stuff down. Close your eyes, unfold your arms, and I want you to start breathing. Don't worry about any thoughts that are coming into your mind. Just start breathing in deeply. <coughs> and exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Don't worry about all the thoughts. Don't worry about your phone. Don't worry about your kids. Don't worry about your stomach growling. Don't worry about any of that. Okay. If you're having trouble focusing, just focus on my words. And you can also put your hand up to your heart. Put your hand up to your heart and just listen to that beat. Boom, 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 boom. If you just tune into that, you'll be able to settle yourself down and you'll be able to have a peaceful moment right here with 200 of your friends. So just relax. Breathe in deeply, and exhale. Breathe in deeply, and exhale. Now mentally, I want you to start from the top of your head, relaxing your scalp. This is, you're gonna visualize this as you're listening to my voice. You're not going to do anything physically. You may just be holding on to, you're holding your arm to your chest or your hand to your chest and breathing in deep. So beginning with your scalp and moving down, just relax your scalp. Feel all the hair follicles. Even if you don't have any hair, you got follicles. Just relax every follicle in your head. Just continue to breathe in and out. Moving down to your eyes. Your eyes are relaxed. Your eyelids are closed. You may be seeing visuals. You may be not seeing anything. It's okay. Moving down to your chin. Relax your chin, your neck muscles, and now your shoulders, your left and your right. Just take a breath in and just let those shoulders drop. Doing perfect. Now, we continue down to our arms. Both of our arms, relax them. If they fold it, unfold them. If your legs are across, uncross them. And just relax both of your arms. It's very good. Very good. Now we continue down to our hips and our thighs and our knees. If you're feeling sleepy, it's okay. Just relax. Just let it go. Now relax our knees. Ooh. Relax our ankles and our feet. Now we're totally, totally relaxed. And we're going to take a little short trip, all of us here together. And in your mind's eye, I want you to have a balloon in whatever hand you want. Either your right hand or your left hand, your lefty. Have that balloon in your left hand. If you're righty, have it in your right hand. And pick your favorite color for that balloon. And I want you to grab that balloon, and that balloon is filled with magical helium, enough to make you rise. And you're gonna take a trip. That trip is gonna be to a place that you've never been to before, that's filled with happiness that's filled with love, that's filled with joy, that's filled with family, friends, toys, money, your pets. It's filled with all that's good. 
and you're going to travel to that place right now just by simply holding on to that balloon. That's the color of your favorite color. When you get to that destination, I want you to start speaking with whoever you see there, whether it's an animal or a rock or a person, it does not matter. We're all connected to this universe. We're all connected. We're all God's children. And I want you to have a conversation with that person or that item. And that conversation should be something like this. I want to be free. I want these things that are tormenting me, that are bothering me, that are hurting me, to not do that any longer. I want to express my love. I want to express myself. I want to express all of the gifts that God gave me. And there are many. I want to love and be loved. I want to go out in the world and not feel any pain. I want to go out in the world and not feel any scarcity or lack. Because the natural state of the universe is abundance. Understand that at your core. It's abundance. So there's no reason for you to feel, I don't have enough of anything. Because all of it is out there for the taking. So while you're there with your balloon having that conversation, now is the chance for you to ask for whatever you want out of life. Think big. Think wild. Think out there. Don't worry about it. You're in a safe space. And I believe in magic. And you should too. Because magic is what you create. When I come back and you hear my voice again, I'm going to count down from 10 to 1. And when I arrive at one, you're going to slowly open up your eyes and you're going to feel totally refreshed and relaxed and ready to continue with the last few minutes and segments of our class today. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, and at one, you're going to slowly open your eyes, feeling totally refreshed and relaxed. One. How do you feel? Any comments? Somebody want to comment? Yes. Refreshed? Any other comments? Calm? It's been said 15 minutes of meditation is equal to about 
three hours of sleep. What? Fifteen minutes of meditation is equal to three hours of sleep. So if you've never meditated, you just had a little sample of it. If you haven't in the past, then good. I encourage you to continue. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any comments, your ladies? Yes, yes. Is that correct? Yeah, from the university. What time? Uh, it's from 6 to 8 on uh, Tuesday. Thank you. Tuesday is here. Thank you. Meditation mm -hmm. space. Would you like to make a comment? Free. I think you have some. <laughs> You're right there, looking at the other way. You? That's right. Um, I think the Spoke to your mother. See how powerful this is, guys? Yeah. Now, why would I pick her? I've been watching her for a while. I don't know why. It's a connection to source. You know? But the source is just telling me if that lady, you know, a chance to release. Thank you. Anyone else? Did anyone not go under or, or you know, meditate a little or, or see the balloon and go up in the space, anything like that? Did anybody not see that? You? Okay. You know why? Distracted. Okay. Did you try putting your hand on your heart? Yeah. Okay. Next time, just try that. And just focus on the on the rhythm and on the beating, and and you can even just say you know, the mind, you know, just go like that, and, and you'll be able to uh, kind of focus on it. Somebody else? I I think it's really good. I like being physical. I when I lie in my bed and I start thinking and I imagine myself spinning and that puts me in a zone. So I did my own little. Nice. Okay, be freestyle. Right? Yeah, freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> but I could have been busy. Oh, I'm reaching that. Oh, congratulations. Nice. Well, I'm going to ask all you guys to press the phone. Um, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely, yep, I agree. Any other comments? Anyone that did not feel any anything or experience anything, Doug? I'm in balance, in connection, greater connection with my divine creator. And it's uh, just like a touch-up. That's when I wake up, this is what I link on to. And I continuously try to carry on, on through the day so that I can share what what he gives me onto others, so his nice. energy. And this man is here from Florida. Wow. And he doesn't even live up here. So and he was, uh, came a long way. To such a, <laughs> actually, it was like a boost of energy to, uh, earlier. <laughs> Like fiery, fiery uh, person up, like fiery. Yeah. Get the juices going. It's like an energy revamp. Right. Yes, sir. I felt relaxed, and that's very difficult for a single mom who always has to run around all over the city and stuff. And just for your information, there's a place called Tibet House downtown, somewhere in the 20s, and they have uh, meditation workshops. They have summer free and some free. Yes. Actually, you know what I remember that I have read in the scriptures of meditate on the word. Mm -hmm. And what I read this morning, I meditated on that. Nice. You want my way here, and then you just rehashed that part to the culminating point of what it was meant for me to be here for and why. I tell you guys, um, one of the most fulfilling things that I've done in my life was, uh, was a meditation group down in Miami that came out of feeling alone. 
I was married at the time. I had a lot of money. I had the, you know, the, the bands parked outside the house, all that stuff. But I was feeling alone, and I was feeling like without any any life. And um, you know, we all we we find God during those moments, right? A lot of times when we're like ignoring it. God or, or spirituality or whatever, but then, of course, I started saying, God, what can I do? What can I do? And this isn't, for whoever doesn't have a religious belief here, this isn't a religious uh, conversation. But basically, I got an answer. And the answer actually came through my training as a coach. Because as a coach, we train to, if you have a situation going on, once you identify it and I assess it, then what is it that you're going to do about it? That, so that's the question that I ask myself. Okay, I'm feeling alone. I'm surrounded by all this material wealth. I'm surrounded by, by my family, by this, by that. But I'm feeling totally alone, and I'm feeling disconnected from people. And I'm a people person. I love each and every one of you here. That's just how I am. And the message came, what are you going to do about it? And so I decided to go on to meetup.com. This was 2007. And I opened up a page, Coral Gables, Florida, where I was living, Coral Gables uh, Meditation Meetup. I had no clue what I was doing. In fact, one of my sisters jumped down my throat and said, what the hell do you know about meditation? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you know? But what I was feeling was inspired. And that, you got to recognize that inspiration is like free gas. Get fired up about something, and then do it. Don't worry about it. Just do it, because that inspiration that passion that you can have for something will put you on the moon, if you allow it to. We're the ones who block ourselves. Remember that slide from Muhammad Ali? We're the ones who block ourselves. There's nobody conspiring doing anything to you. It's you doing it to yourself. So once I got inspired, and I said, this is what I'm going to do, I still didn't do it. I went to another coach that I knew, a friend of mine, and I told him my idea. And I said, you know what? feeling alone, I'm feeling, you know, like, like, like I don't have any, any uh, connection to people here in no community, um, and I'm thinking of doing this meditation group, and, but I don't know, I don't know where to start, and he just looks at me and he says, Jesus started with 12, and I was like, and again, it wasn't a religious anything that he was trying to teach me, he was just trying to like, snap me out of it, don't worry about it, just start, and guess what, it started with me, and before I was done, and I had to leave Miami to come back home, I had over 250 members in that group. And week after week, I, I eventually called the group Meditation Mondays. And week after week, I had 30 or 40 people in my living room, down in Florida, meditating. Cops, lawyers, doctors, you name it. And one thing they all said to me, we've been looking for something like this. So meaning that I just connected, I, I tapped into something that everybody was already feeling. People were already feeling disconnected. Everybody in a nice fancy car. You've been to Miami, right? I call Miami now Fantasy Island. So they call it Mad the Magic City. There's no disrespect on it. You know, it's a beautiful place. The quality of life is phenomenal. But I couldn't thrive there. You know, after all the all the toys were gone, I was like, what's next? You know? I need people that are for real, that are down to earth. And over there, I found them flights, just like some people might hear about places like Los Angeles. That's why they call it Lala or whatever. Right? So, a, similar, a similar thing to that, that it was nice while I was able to enjoy that quality of life, but I wasn't able to sustain it. And after that was gone, there was no connection to people. And that's when I, I realized that, and I said, wow, I'm totally alone here. What do I do about this to build community? So what I confirmed was that everyone else was feeling the same exact thing. And I was just a conduit to bring them together. That's it. I passed around a basket and stuff, but half the time nobody would put anything. It didn't matter. And it was one of the most fulfilling things I've done in my life, and it was <coughs> nothing. I already had the house. You know, the, the house wasn't, you know, it didn't matter whether 50 people came over or 200 or nobody. So to be able to share these things and do these guided meditations with people that were pure inspiration, I would try to kind of pre-program what I was going to talk about on, a, on any given Monday. It would never work out. I would wind up getting like what they call, what they refer to as synchronicity. 
signs, like seeing something three times that day. And by the time I would see it the third time, I would say, that's the message I got to deliver. Almost like a, like a preacher, if you will, but without all the religious whatever. And then I would deliver it. And then, after they come out of it like you guys did, I would be like, oh, shit, did I say the right? I would have this self-doubt. Did I deliver the right message or not? So another thing that I proved with that group was that 100% of the time, I was on the mark. Not because I'm good, but because I was connected. So that connected to source, you can't fail. It's your gut. It's your intuition. It never <laughs> fails. Trust it. Stop overruling it. And that's what I learned, that once I connect, it doesn't matter what I think. Because that it's like a GPS or, or, or autopilot. It takes over. And just... Just give in. Just let it go. And be with that flow. And whatever you're looking to do, it's going to blossom. Guaranteed. Try it. This exercise we're not going to be able to get through, but you have, you have a, a sheet there that says uh, forgiveness, which I borrowed from the coaching institute. I got actually another one that's even more powerful, but um, it's, it's a little trickier to do so. I decided to bring the simple one for today for you guys to take home. But let me share something with you. On this forgiveness, it's a very serious matter. You may, you may see it as, why should I forgive that person that did this to me or whatever. And those are all valid reasons. All I'm saying is, if you want to feel relief, and you want to empty out that vessel and let in the good stuff that you're looking for, do this. Um, when I've done it, let me tell you, I get calls and emails from the people that that I just said, hey, forgive me for what I've done to you, because we're not perfect. We do stuff that we're not aware of sometimes. And and, and uh, I ask them to forgive me and that I forgive them. And the person doesn't even have to be alive. It can be somebody that passed on already, because that's still in your heart. You're still holding on to it. So this is about you letting go of that stuff and connecting. And believe me, you'll get something back from the universe that says, good job. Okay? Quickly, I want to cover fear. Fear is just another word for false expectations of hearing real. It's made up. We make it up. Because fear is usually connected, and anxiety connected to something that hasn't even happened. You're thinking it's going to happen. Yes or no? Oh, I got to take that test tomorrow. Man, I'm going to fail. It hasn't even happened. Meanwhile, you've been studying for three months. You're probably going to ace the test. Because you let fear and anxiety take a hold of it. False expectation appearing real. Expectation. Write it down. And if you think uh, it doesn't work in Spanish, it's falsa expectativa de apareciendo real. So there you go. Both ways. The A is appearance. False, uh, false expectations appearing real. Then you have another sheet there as well, which is the one that you're going to build. And I'll go over this before we, we uh, disconnect here of how we're going to put all of this together. Very basic coaching tool and business tool is Smart Goal, which basically stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. That means that whatever you're wishing for, make sure that it's specific. So when you, when you start creating that blueprint for yourself or that, or that roadmap, you're very specific. I want a car. Okay, what brand of car? I want a Mercedes. Okay, what color? A uh, brown. Uh, what model? That's specific. That's what specific means. Be very specific as to what you're designing. Measurable. Okay, that, that you can actually say, okay, well, I took steps to, I went to the bank to get the loan to get the car. That's measurable. You have a specific goal, and, you're, and there's a measurable action that you're taking. Attainable. Ah, I'm making 100 grand a year. That's doable for me. I paid all my my student loans off. 
Think. Attainable. Okay? Realistic. No pie in the sky stuff. Be realistic. If you're making 30, don't go buy an eighty thousand dollar car. Not even least. No matter how good the deal looks. Timely. Make sure that you can put a timeline to it. That you can say, okay, I'm gonna do all these things between now and June 15th. That's timely. And it's also very specific and it's measurable and it's attainable. It's realistic. You have a sheet there with you for it. Auto suggestion and hetero suggestion. Okay. Somebody here tell me uh, what's the difference between under auto suggestion, what's the difference between those two sentences? I'm getting better and better every day in every way. I'm not good at math, never have been, and never will be. Optimist and pessimist. Anybody else? Yes. Opposites? Growth mindset and fixed mindset. What was that? Growth mindset and fixed mindset. Yes. Anything else? Doubt and negative. Yes. And I'll tell you something else. These, the auto suggestion is what you're saying to yourself. Good or bad, doesn't matter. This is the self-talk that's going on. So if you want to, you know how they say the mind plays tricks on us? Well, we got to play tricks on the mind. Because if you don't, it's going to play tricks on you. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ways that you can play tricks on your mind with things they, they, they call affirmations, and which is connected to auto-suggestion. It's you, auto, you yourself are telling yourself. You're psyching yourself out. That's what you're doing there. But you can also psych yourself out for negative things by thinking like this. I know plenty of people that you ask them, you know, oh, I hate math. I don't know how to do it. You know, that's a, a self-defeating thought that they have that's connected to auto-suggestion that they give themselves that, that loop day in and day out. They're not good at math yet. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to go back to the slide? Okay. So, so um, everybody's got that, right? Hetero suggestion, tell me the difference between that. You will never be smart enough to get into that school. If you apply yourself, you can be anything you want to be. That's right. You got it. That's what our parents tell us. That's what our school teachers tell us. That's what our friends tell us. That's why you got to start thinking about maybe changing friends if they're not empowering you. Seriously. When I cleaned house, man, it was, it was a bloodbath. Because I was like, I love my people, but I realized they weren't empowering. And I had, yes, sir. You know, but that generally comes from security. Because, you know, you grow up with certain friends, you grow up with certain communities, and, you know, you like these people for certain things, and there are certain people that bring the relationship, right? But when you start moving forward, you know, because I, I believe that every five years, you know, your mind changes, your thought process changes, it's a little cyclical. And as you move forward, certain people can accept that you're moving beyond. Yeah, you know, it, it's like, for example, I went to school with Mark Anthony. You know, I, I see the paradigm, right? I, I, I provide social services for my community, and he's a multi-million dollar global star. So, you see, it, I mean, I don't have any envy for him. I'm actually really proud of him because he came out of this community. What I'm not so proud of is the fact that they don't give back to the people. Yeah, thank you. And I tell you another thing. Um, I used to have uh, an internet company that was uh, still around, very successful, that I sold uh, before the dot bomb to the owners of Amega, the Spanish broadcasting system. And that website still around, it's called Amusica.com. And I tell you that that was a great opportunity that I was blessed with to be able to sell that company and before the market crash and everything. But there were some valuable lessons that I learned now when I got kind of pushed into a whole nother level of business and dealing with people that were extremely wealthy, starting with the owner of that company who was a billionaire at the time, okay? So I'm proud to say, hey, I slowed that guy down long enough to listen to the middle of me and sell him something. 
But at the end of the day, one of the other things that I uncovered, not just with him, but with many other people, that the money that they had did not represent them being any happy. In fact, a lot of them, including Mark, which I know personally, um, were not very happy people. And so that represents a, a challenge for these folks. And that's where uh, that life wheel can help you guys correct that so that you can spend some time addressing what is it the areas that I'm not doing so well in and why. Why is a powerful question that they keep asking why, why, why. You, you ever heard, you ever got annoyed by a kid that just says why? You know that's the purest question that you can ever hear. Because they'll just keep asking you, well, why? And you'll answer it and they'll go, but why? And they'll answer, you answer it again and they'll go, why? So what, what that's really doing, if you did that, did that as an adult, you're, you're peeling all the onions away from that question and bringing it to its purest form. So try that. Play tricks on your mind and, and come, you know, come across a challenge you're having and just ask yourself, well, why? And write it out, why? 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 And drill it down to its core to get to the answer. And then be prepared to take action, because if you, you can have all the knowledge in the world, if you don't take the action, it doesn't matter. So yes, heterosexual, uh, I was going to say heterosexual, heterosexual, uh, <laughs> okay, so that's that. Now, we did it, we did it a little bit this way. So when you're thinking of meditating, you know, go easy on a coffee. Go easy on a coffee, go easy on a sugar. You already know these things. Find a quiet spot, close your eyes, place your hand on your heart, visualize, charge it with emotion. That's why the young lady over there, when she saw her mom in her in her travels, emotional, right? You almost cried just now when you, when you brought that memory back up too. So it's about emotion. And ladies, you wash your hair all the time. Wash, rinse, repeat. Do these things and repeat it. Do these things and repeat it. Who goes to sleep with the TV on here? And I stopped doing that years ago when I realized the damage I was doing. Who wakes up to, uh, to the radio? Who wakes up to an alarm that's going, ah, ah, ah? <laughs> If you heard my alarm, it's hot. It's like beautiful music. It's like I wake up and I'm like, that's how I wake up. Seriously. Yep. So understand that these are the things you have to do to take control of your own life and not let somebody else progress. No wonder you'll be in the, in, in the mood or irritable if your alarm clock is and then you turn on the TV and it's all bad news. Right? And you're trying to just hear the weather report, but it's got all the other stuff sandwiched in between. Okay? I don't even have a TV in my apartment anymore. Very serious as, as, as to what I consume, what I bring in through my senses, what I put into my ears, all of that, I'm very serious as to. There's something, and I have the ability now, if it's something that I don't want to hear, you know, I do tune it out, but I have to go like this. That's, you know, challenge. <laughs> but, block. Sometimes, I mean, you know, I have a laptop. I didn't bring my laptop today, but I have a computer and stuff. You know, my mom's TV got busted, so I gave her mine, because I was like, I don't, I don't really need it. You know, I watch Netflix and specific, this is what I'm saying, I watch very targeted stuff. I don't watch stuff that they put out for the masses, because that's where it's dangerous. The masses is to, is to get you like a robot, following somebody, somebody else's little song. So if you're not aware of that, you know, you're going to be a victim. Yes. I know that very Yeah. 
it is specific. It, in my opinion, it is specific. One of the one of the best things that any one of us can learn to do is to model. Model means copy. So, in your mind, you know who is the picture of a confidence uh, or, or an example of a person that maybe you perceive them as being confident. Maybe it might be somebody in your family. It might be your mom. You go, man, my mom is my hero. She's really confident. But I wish I were like that. Well, that represents an opportunity for you to copy that, to emulate it. And it's called model coaching. So you can start with that by being specific and as to who are you going to model or what quality or characteristic or trait you're going to model for that person. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, we'll keep asking. It's all right. Okay, yes. Yes, please. Um, yes. Okay, now, this is the homework. I call this little fun thing, dare to be aware. If you become a coaching client of mine, that's the first exercise that we do. Dare to be aware. Why? Because it's painful sometimes to be aware that you're your own worst enemy. It's painful to realize, you know, you're overweight because you, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, they go straight to bed. <laughs> you know? It's painful to realize that you don't go to the gym uh, because you're busy watching TV all the time. You claim you don't have time. It's painful. So, this you're going to do it like a log. And it has columns with day, time, and activity. And I can, I can easily do one of these. There's plenty of them that already exist that I can give you, but I want you to work at this one, because this, one, this one's going to be mind-blowing for you. Because you're going to actually write it out. And like it says there, fill it honestly and faithfully. So an example is, if you wake up at 8 and you go to bed at 11, that log is going to have a column with 8 to 11 and Monday through Sunday. And then another column is going to have activity. So from 8 to 9 in the morning, when you woke up at 8, what did you do between 8 and 9? That's the activity. Here comes 9 o'clock. What did you do from 9 to 10? I guarantee you, you won't get past maybe more than a week of doing this because you won't be able to stand so Because you're going to realize, wow, I just let go of how many hours doing whatever, and I claim that I, I don't have time for this or some time for that. So it's, it's a very powerful but painful, sometimes painful exercise, but very necessary. Please take it seriously. Okay. When you get through that, that's when then you should go to your sheet of the smart goals. You have that exercise already. The, the explanation of the smart goals is pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty thorough. Okay, the life wheel is the one that tells you what are my challenges, what are my problem areas that I need to show up. We all have problems. Okay, and that one is on a scale of one to ten. So if you're doing well in an area, it's going to be ten. If you're not doing so well, it's going to be closer to one. Right? That's how you fill in that. The instructions are on. And once you have this plan for yourself set up, then what you're going to work on is enhancing it with meditation, auto suggestions, affirmations, and repetition. What is repetition? What's another word for repetition? Consistency, what else? Habit. Religiously. Yes. So if you can form a bad habit, believe me, you can form a good habit. So let's get rid of the bad ones, or at least some of them. <laughs> some of them we need, some of them we like. And, uh, and replace them with some good habits that serve us and that are congruent and in line with these other goals that we're identifying here. Because what's the point? If, if you're not in congruency, none of this is going to work. And you're going to find that out right away. It doesn't take months to figure it out. Any questions?
Okay, there's the email. Howyourhour at gmail.com. Yes, all again. Uh, Mr. Esteban, <laughs> yes. uh, I would like to say that even though the other courses on Saturday have been interesting and informative, mm -hmm. You came in and you didn't have a PhD up there and you didn't, you know, you didn't toot your own horn and yet I think that was me. This one was one of the best because you kept telling us how much you love us and how much you care. And I think that you appeal to our sense of uh, to a sense of who we are. And um, and I think that that's good. And Thank I you. think I really you should appreciate continue that. your work. And what I would ask everyone is to please write down that email and send me a testimony. That's, that's the gasoline that I need. That's the food for my soul. <laughs> yeah, that's a website too, empoweryourhour.com, which is up on the top. That's an actual website um, that you can read more stuff. But the email you use is that one. And if you wanted more information, you can say what we yeah, what I'm, what I'm thinking of doing is setting up a, uh, a group coaching that's going to be like a Skype or online, like, like on the phone. And so if anybody is interested in that, please, everybody just send me your testimony and put a little note that you'd like to be considered for the uh, group coaching. Okay? Yes. And I do individual coaching too, but I, you know, again, it's the same 24 hours a day. So I have paid clients and I, can, I, I have a manager. Yes, I'm going to send the slide. If you send me the email. Because right. I don't have that list that, that Cindy. Uh, there's one last thing that I want to show you guys before, before we go. Man. It's a little video. So. Juan Esteban here, and this is my production assistant, Coco Chanel. Have you ever wondered how is it that people get into a local political office, like a senator person or a councilman or councilwoman? Well, today I'm going to share with you some information on a wonderful organization called the Latino Leadership Institute. And I'm going to go pay the president of the organization a visit. His name is Jaime Stalis, and he's going to tell you everything there is to know about Politics 101 how to get into a local political office, how to build your base of constituents, and everything there is to know about that. So come and join me. Come on, Coco. Let's go. Good to see you. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I want to thank you for joining us today here to talk a little bit about the Latino Leadership Institute. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to discuss and share with people what the philosophy of the Latino Leadership Institute is. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, the Latino Leadership Institute was uh, the genesis of the Latino Leadership Institute is basically on the frustration of the Latino community in order to have a proper and efficient political representation. Um, what we have done during the last few years is trying to make sure that we try to train a new leadership in the Latino community that basically knows the nuts and bolts of how a political campaign is organized. And that way what we try to do is to make sure that they become independent from the political machineries that usually tend to capture this new talent that is coming up in the uh, communities and then make them their own. By training them on how to put together political campaigns, they don't need the favor or the or, or become independent of the political machineries. Therefore, they can create a direct link with the voters. Therefore, they can create a platform that is directly linked to the voters and not to the political machinery. That way we democratize the process even more. 
and what's the history behind this? How did this idea come to you? Well, this is this is not a new idea. This is something that uh, the Chicanos have implemented for the last 30 years in the Southwest of the United States. It's also in the Midwest. It's the Southwest Board of Registration. Uh, there is the uh, USA Academy in Chicago. And this is something that we needed in the East Coast of the United States. And basically, we're just basically emulating what others have been doing. But this was something that was very important to have in the East Coast because we were not training people. Basically, the training, if you can call it training, was being done by uh, political machineries for their own men. Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Brent Warren. I am here at the Latino Leadership Institute for Rental Activism and Leadership Academy. Today's class was taught by Eli Murphy and Michael Evans on this I have to say that with my money, this has been the most exciting class by far in the show. The four classes that I've had the pleasure of attending, including this one, have all been very excellent. Uh, but messaging is one of the core elements of electoral um, politics and campaign. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Sayer. I'm a senior at the Latino Institute. Today's class is being learned about campaign messaging. This is a really good class. Um, I like I've been in politics for about two years now, and just being around, knowing the hands on about messaging and actually hearing these skills and these knowledge and so on, it's providing a great perspective. It was a really good class, so I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Hi, my name is Wendy Menyus. I'm here from graduating from my girls' college. I currently work for Vanessa Gibson. And I'm here at the Latino Leadership Institute to get more involved in the nitty gritty back backhand stuff of campaign and campaign work. So today's class is by Mike Davis, who is an incredible guy. I mean, who says that he's the smartest guy in the room and there's no doubt about it. My name is Peggy Morales, and I'm really grateful for what the Latino Leadership Institute has done. Not only have they brought this class locally, but they've kept it affordable, they've kept it comprehensive, they've kept it exciting, and it's actually the high point of my week. I'm learning a great deal about what it means to be involved in politics, despite the fact that I am a locally elected official. Signed up. It's free. You learn all that. All that video and stuff was done was done by by uh, by me um, at their facility, and it didn't cost anything. And you know, it's good enough. And also, we have the raffle coming up. You're gonna have. So you're gonna hear from the set and Alan and some other people here as well. To uh, I'm sorry, what's it? Gloria to uh, for the raffle. So stick around. Just a couple more minutes. Uh, one more thing, guys. This was an awesome class. Uh, not just this one, but all of them. Uh, please stick around for the raffle. Also, last week, while uh, we're putting together, or uh, we have together a committee for the dollars, our annual fundraiser in dollars, that comes up in June, if I'm not corrected. Um, I know a couple of people didn't come to class last week, so um, if you could just please stay, it's probably going to take like 15 minutes to explain to you uh, what exactly we're going to do for the dollar, uh, as far as logistics wise, and uh, what we're doing. So please we'll just stick around and find out what committee you can join. It's an awesome thing, that's some special people come around. So. You know, get your tuxes, get your gowns on, you know, and let's do my thing. So, thank you guys so much. Please just stick around for the raffle. We got a, a lot of money to give away. Yes, we do. We have that.